But put your hands together and welcome Dr. Sebastian in our way. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So it's Hi. Okay. I just think I was too close to the other mics. So it's good to be home. The Bastia Church of God has always been my home ever since I was this high. I used to come every Sunday for Sunday school. But it's good to be home. So I know a lot of individuals. Actually, who here has taken the vaccine so far? Can you just give me a show of hands? Oh, okay. That's a, that's a fair amount. That's good. That's good. So I know a lot of individuals have a lot of fears and concerns about the vaccine. We haven't lived in a normal world for over a year now. And I just wanted to start with something a little bit more personal to me, um, why I chose to take the vaccine. I, I took the vaccine on the first day it was available, okay? So why I chose to take the vaccine? I chose to take the vaccine for my family, my friends, my colleagues, and anyone who could possibly get sick from COVID-19. And the reason why I chose to do so so quickly is because I know of individuals who have gotten severely ill from COVID-19 personally. I'm not sure if anyone here has the unfortunate um, situation where they know someone who got severely sick. So I have friends overseas who are not in such a blessed country as St. Kitts who hasn't really gotten any severe illness or hospitalizations or deaths, who got into contact with COVID-19 and now they can't function the way they normally function before because they're suffering from the long-term complications from the disease. They, they're tired every day. And these are young individuals. These are young people in their 20s, no previous health issues, and they're having complications from the illness, body pain, et cetera. And they can't go to work now because of this. They haven't been to work for over five months and they've recovered from it. They recovered from COVID-19 and then these are the complications afterwards. So that's why I chose to go and get the vaccine because I want to protect everyone I care and love around me. Not just myself, but it's for everyone. So I hope this is a very interactive session. So I hope you guys hit me with all the, the hard questions that you have stored up and waiting for me. So the AstraZeneca vaccine, this is the one that we have here in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, we've had it here for quite a while now. And I know there's been some misinformation um, being spread via the news, whether it's WhatsApp or social media. And I'm just here to clear up or alleviate any fears or concerns that you may have about it. So the AstraZeneca, it's a vaccine. I mean, I'm sure everyone here has taken a vaccine at least one time in their life, um, whether it was in school, uh, growing up, or if they take the annual flu shot. So it's a vaccine. Um, the AstraZeneca itself, what it does is it prevents severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And that's the most important thing um, that a vaccine can do. And the reason why that's important is because even though it's a possibility you can catch COVID-19, it prevents you from getting severely sick, it prevents you from being, being in the hospital, and it prevents you from dying. And when you do those three things, it keeps society functioning because you don't have a strain on the healthcare system People can still go back to work in a relatively soon manner. So even if you get a little sick, a little cold, a little sniffle there, it won't severely affect you. And it also decreases the chance that you can transmit it to your loved ones or the people around you. It also stops the virus from mutating as fast or replicating. And when you do that, then it's 
very unlikely that this virus can spread a mutation change into a more deadly form. So that's why it's important to vaccinate. And that's why there's the goal for herd immunity, where it's 70% of the population. We've been doing a good job. We're at, oh, we're at 31, close to 32% as of yesterday, I believe, which is very good. So we're nearly halfway there. And it's only been two months since we've had the vaccine here in St. Kitts, so we're nearly halfway there. We're doing a lot better than most countries in the world. So hats off to the individuals who went out and got the vaccine and, and all those individuals who are thinking of going and getting the vaccine, because I know people have some concerns. Mo majority of individuals are in the middle, like, mm, should I go and get the vaccine? I'll wait a little, you know, but the longer you wait, the, the more likely the virus has a chance to mutate and change into a deadlier form. And that's why the whole world has the same goal, not just St. Kitts and Nevis, but every country in the world has the same goal to go and get vaccinated. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask me at any time right now um, about the, the vaccine. So regarding the AstraZeneca, it's a, what we call a vector vaccine. Okay, so it takes a common cold virus with instructions to produce COVID-19 proteins, all right? So it sends information via a common cold virus to produce COVID-19 proteins. And what your body does is it sees these COVID-19 proteins. The proteins itself, they can't infect you. They can't make you sick. They're just the outer shell of the virus. So it can't make you sick. It's not the actual virus and your body sees this and it forms antibodies. So what these antibodies do is, if you come into contact with real virus, these same antibodies latches on to these same COVID-19 proteins that the real virus has, and it works as a bullseye or a target for your immune cells to go and attack it and destroy it. Okay, so and this is called acquired immunity. All right, so there's two types of immunity we have. We have our innate immunity, where, you know, if you get sick, you know, your body fights it off, but it's not that specific, all right? So the acquired immunity allows your body to deal with specific um, attacks, such as, for instance, the vaccine will stimulate your body to acquire an acquired immunity, and it can specifically target the COVID-19 virus and deal with it in a quick manner, so that's why you wouldn't get sick once you get the vaccine because that's why it prevents you from getting severely ill, hospitalized, and dying, okay? And so the side effects of the vaccine, I know some people are worried about the side effects. Um, you can get a headache, you can get a little tired, you can get some, a small fever, um, some body pains, um, some nausea, some vomiting. Um, the most common side effects reported was headache, some body pain, and, some fe and a slight fever. But you have medication there that you can alleviate those symptoms. So if you have um, a fever, headache, body pain, you can take some paracetamol. And usually these symptoms don't last more than 24 to 48 hours. Right, so they're easily dealt with. Um, what we want everyone to be very conscious of is allergies. So if you do have uh, allergies, you need to speak to your doctor that you know. Um, and just look at the ingredients of the vaccine with them, see if there's anything there that you can possibly be allergic to in the vaccine because um, that's what we're most concerned about is allergic reactions. And that's why when you go and take the vaccine, we always ask you to stay at least 15 minutes after so we can at least monitor you in case there's an allergic reaction going on. And usually the 15 minutes is when the more severe reactions happen. And so after the 15 minutes, we still want you to um, check yourself just in case that any reactions can happen later on. But usually these ones aren't so severe. Oh, is there a question? Yes. Yep. If someone has low platelets, is low. it recommended that they take the vaccine? Low platelets, okay. So. If someone has low platelets, I would definitely um, hold off on taking the vaccine. And 
the, the reason behind this is because um, low platelets, um, you can possibly get bleeding with low platelets, and the vaccine itself can, um, it has um, side effects, what I just previously mentioned, and that could be a little detrimental, okay? So I would go to your doctor um, and see if you're fit enough to take um, the vaccine um, before I decide to take it, if you do have low platelets, because there's treatments for individuals with low platelets, whether it is uh, transfusion to raise your platelet count, et cetera. All right, so I would be very careful with that and I will cross check with my private physician regarding that. Okay, and any other questions? Feel free, you can ask me anything at all. Oh, there's a question, oh, two questions. Hello. Hi, if your respiratory tract is um, affected at the moment and you are currently on antibiotics, is it recommended to take the vaccine? Okay, so if you're currently ill, I would wait until I am better to take the vaccine because your body's currently fighting off an infection and our immune system, we need our immune system to respond to the vaccine as best as possible. So I would wait until I'm better so my immune system can just focus on the vaccine to build up a defense against COVID-19. So I would wait until um, you finish the antibiotic therapy and then you can go and take the vaccine afterwards once you're feeling well. Hi. Hi, you mentioned um, side effects such as the common cold and fever. Yes. However, I haven't heard you mention the possibility of blood clots in the brain. Okay. I have been following Mm -hmm. um, the media, not WhatsApp, but yeah, real the media. legitimate media. Okay. And there have been indications that there is a possibility of blood cl clots in okay. the um, brain from taking AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is that one of the possible side effects, and the second question that I have are okay. what medical facilities, I suppose, or medical protocols are in place here in St. Kitts mm -hmm. should someone develop blood clots in the brain. Okay. So, yes. I'm taking the vaccine. Okay. So, yes, there has been um, a lot of media about blood clots um, due to the AstraZeneca. There's actually been some media about the other vaccines about, the, about blood clots, but it's less publicized. Um, so there is actually no concrete proof that the AstraZeneca actually is causing these blood clots because there's so few in number. Um, there's so few in number. So naturally in the population, so if no one got vaccinated, we expect one in every 1,000 adults to actually develop a blood clot. And so when we look at the actual numbers compared to the people that are being vaccinated, it's much lower than in the natural population. So currently, they're just follow, there's, there's no actual link to it, except that these, they're noticing, okay, this person got the AstraZeneca and then they developed the blood clot. Um, but they haven't linked the AstraZeneca to it. So for instance, if there is a million people we would exp who got a million people, we expect at least a thousand people out of that million to develop blood clots naturally, even if they weren't vaccinated. So the vaccinated community is actually getting less blood clots than the unvaccinated community. So because um, the AstraZeneca and the other vaccines are new, there has been a microscope put on anything or any type of reactions that are happening, um, whether or not so there's no proof there's actual link to it, but there's a microscope put on it because it's new and they want to make sure that they have the list of side effects and people, and it's not causing blood clots in individuals. So they're still um, looking at it to determine whether or not it's actually caused by the AstraZeneca. But the numbers are so low that they, they haven't really made a true link to it. I, I hope that answers the question. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, if there's anything in place. Okay, so um, blood clot. So if anyone does develop a blood clot, 
um, we treat it the same way that we would treat anyone who has um, a blood clot regularly because I see blood clots um, nearly every week in St. Kitts. I work in the emergency department, so we would treat them with blood thinning medication um, to dissolve the blood clot, basically, and individuals would just um, recover and then return naturally. So if anyone has any signs of any blood clots, then we would treat them as regular. So um, whether it's a blood clot in the leg, blood clot in the lungs, we have medication for that and we would treat accordingly. Yeah? Um, did, did that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, any other questions? Good, good morning. Good morning. Um, one question. Yep. First two cases we had here in St. Kitts, First, first two. First two cases, okay. With the mother and the son. Okay. Right. Um, my question is, how did they recover? How did they recover? Um, um, they, they recovered fine, as, as to my knowledge, they, they're yeah, okay. I just want to know how. How did they recover? recover? Can you explain the process by which how did they recover? From okay, the so, so the um, like any like anyone's process here, um, they were managed symptomatically, okay? So whatever symptoms they had, we would treat the symptoms. And after a certain time, the virus would pass through their system, and then that's how they, were, they would recover. So if they had fever, chills, difficulty breathing, I'm not sure, I didn't treat them myself, but whatever symptoms that they would have, we would manage. So if they had difficulty breathing, we would give them oxygen. If they had fever, pain, we would give them pain medication or uh, antipyretic to lower the fever um, or anything there. That's what, that's what we would do. Um, What's the follow-up? Just follow-up. Follow-up question. <laughs> what therapeutics were used on these individuals? Um, who were, yeah. which, which individuals particularly? First. Two the cases. The we first had here. Two? He I, just I happened to be my coworker and his mother. Okay. And when I spoke to him, mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to give you some history. Somehow I was able to mm -hmm. dialogue with one of the members from the medical bureaucracy here in St. Kitts. Yep. And it was very intense. I asked him the same question. The two cases that came here first, mm -hmm. how did they recover? couldn't give me a, a clear answer. And then he mentioned something to me about a drug. Okay. I looked at him again. I asked the good doctor, what drug did they use? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing. Okay. I went back into my office mm -hmm. and I spoke to my coworker. Mm -hmm. I asked him, what drug? were you given? He said, nothing. Okay, that's a possibility. He recovered naturally. That's a possibility, yes. Um, so, so I'm, that's why I'm asking you, like, how did they recover? Is it possible that our own innate, you know, immune system could, has, has what it takes to overcome this killer coronavirus? You would okay. say that? So, yes, you can recover without any medication at all, you may not have any symptoms of coronavirus. But what we're finding out is, um, like I mentioned before, the reason why I chose to get vaccinated is because my, f my friend, my colleague in the UK had coronavirus and they recovered fine. But a few weeks after, a few months after, they began to have these complications for the coronavirus where they're having chronic body pains and we're noticing that one in every three individuals who recover from the coronavirus, they start to have neurological problems. They start to develop all these weird problems. They start to develop brain fog where they can't think as quickly as possible or um, develop their thoughts. Um, some individuals become depressed. Some individu sometimes it affects their heart and sometimes people get blood clots from the coronavirus as well. 
and it affects the entire body as well. So if you get, if you get the coronavirus, um, you may recover from the initial infection, but it can leave a long lasting effect on your body afterwards. So yes, they can recover without so they, they, anything. They, they could have a long lasting effect. Like how, how long after this? If they recover from the coronavirus, how long after do they have these effects? Because um, so it, it varies between um, individuals. Um, sometimes you may not be able, it varies between individuals. Um, sometimes we're not, we're not able to determine how long this effect will come into play, um, but we're seeing, we're seeing all of this start to happen to individuals who have coronavirus. And some individuals may not get any complications. So look, now we're looking at at least 12 to 15 percent of individuals will have a possible a blood clot who have had a previous coronavirus infection. Um, one in every three individual who had coronavirus can get neurological symptoms. So that could range from not, be, not being able to taste or smell properly for a while to pain, uh, body pain. So these are the things that we're noticing. And um, my friend, um, actually has problems with their heart and they're 28 years old and that was from an infection of the coronavirus so we're not able to determine exactly how long these effects will last so it, it it's great that you i don't i don't know if your colleague has any effects i hope i hope they don't and i'm and he's very lucky That's great, and you know he's a lucky he's a lucky few, um, but I know of people who aren't so lucky. So, yep. Yes, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. So you have to cover yourself to protect other individuals because. Um, the first person I thought about um, was my mom. You know, that's the first person I, th I thought about um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, my mom is getting up there in age. <laughs> but she looks young for her age. She looks young for her age. And that's the first person I thought of. I'm like, I'm working in the hospital. I'm, I was working over in the, coro the COVID section in the hospital taking care of individuals during the lockdown and the pandemic. So the first person I thought about, oh, I can't come home to my mom and give, us, give her this virus, and then she's not protected, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah, you just can't look at someone and tell how they'll react. And what we are noticing is that it doesn't have any um, biases towards age anymore. We're actually finding that um, younger individuals are getting more sick now, especially with the variants, the, the mutated versions of the coronavirus. Um, it's more deadly and it's, easy, it's more easily passed along. Huh? Question? Yes, um, good morning. Thank you, good doctor, morning. for coming to share with us. Um, we are grateful for the information. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I've yep. been hearing lots of things going around, one of which is that the vaccine is going to change one's DNA, okay. right? So for those of us who, are, who don't know what DNA is, or can, can you tell us about that, or allay our fears in that regard? Okay, so um, I know where this fear actually comes from. Um, so what happens is there's, the, there's different vaccines and they essentially send instructions um, via something called RNA, all right? So RNA is called messenger RNA and all, all of our cells have messenger RNA and that's how our cells kind of communicate with each other and communicate to do certain functions and instructions. So what they did is they took RNA or in the case of AstraZeneca, DNA, to send instructions to produce these COVID-19 proteins. So 
That's all it does. It just gives the instructions to produce the COVID-19 proteins so our bodies can see the proteins and respond to them if they see the real thing. And what happens is that's completely destroyed after by our immune system because our immune system is stimulated so it can destroy everything. So the vaccine actually doesn't remain in you. The DNA or the mRNA doesn't actually remain in you once you get the vaccine because the immune system destroys it. So it doesn't integrate and mix with your DNA. All it does is send a message to stimulate the production of the proteins. Okay? Would you say the new mRNA uh, vaccine, or whatever it is, um, is it in its experimental stage? The mRNA vaccine? It's not in an experimental stage because they've had the mRNA technology. Sorry, the mRNA, for, mRNA tech, yeah. The mRNA technology for about two to three years now. So they've been working with that. The one that, the AstraZeneca that we're using, it's not mRNA technology, it's um, a technology we've had since 1970. So that's been um, long documented on how to use it and stuff like that. So that was actually one of the reasons I felt very safe with the AstraZeneca because it's a technology that we've had for so long um, and we've been using it for a while, decades now. So the mRNA is a little newer. Um, oh, so it's, yeah, it's so newer. The, so the Pfizer and Moderna, those, that technology is a little newer, and, and compared to the AstraZeneca, we've been using that technology for decades to, to create vaccines and those type of things. And that's also the reason why, because the mRNA technology, it, that's why it has to be stored in such cold storage, because um, the mRNA itself is very fragile, so it needs to be stored in negative degrees 70 Celsius uh, or negative 30 degrees Celsius, so, so it can be viable for us to use, as opposed to the AstraZeneca, where you can store it in a regular medical refrigerator, as opposed to a super ultra cold storage refrigerator. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, after taking the vaccine. Yeah. How long would it be last in our body? Like, I mean, like a year, a two. What mm -hmm. our life will be after taking it? If we'll have to get a booster. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So after taking the vaccine, so currently we're still we're still waiting to see how long it lasts, right? Um, because we can't determine that prior. We have to actually see how long this immunity lasts, how long these antibodies last in our body. So currently, since the first person has taken the vaccine, they have had a well enough immune response to, to have immunity against COVID-19 or some type of protection against COVID-19. So we'll have to wait to see how long it actually lasts. So regarding the booster, so currently, currently we, we have immunity against all the variants with all the vaccines. So because the variants are at least close enough so that the effectiveness of any vaccine would protect you against the variants. Um, so that, uh, sorry, what was the second follow-up? Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the booster, the only reason we would need a booster is if we find a variant that these vaccines stop working against. All right, that's the only reason. If there's a new mutation that the vaccine is not effective against, then that's the only reason you'd really need a booster shot. Okay? So if we do reach, let's say, herd immunity where the virus can't really mutate, it can't replicate, it can't jump from one person to another easily, then it's going to eventually die out because it doesn't have an environment to live in. 
if it doesn't have an environment to properly live in and thrive in, then it's going to, to die out. You know, it's just like uh, humans. If we don't have a good environment to live in, our numbers are going to dwindle and we'll eventually go extinct. So that's the, I guess, the purpose of the vaccine, to create an, an inhospitable environment so the virus can so the virus can't thrive, mutate, replicate, etc. Yeah. Question. The second dose. Okay. All right. That's no problem. Yes. Okay. Um, so not necessarily. You don't necessarily have to get a, a, a headache again with the second dose. But because you got one with the first dose, I would still um, prepare myself for, this, for another headache again. But I would, what I would do is I would take some medication for headaches. Um, after I'd get the second dose, perhaps a few hours after, I'd take some headache medication to alleviate um, the headache before it actually comes on. That's what I would do. So the reason why you take the second dose is it gives your body a second chance to look at the COVID-19 protein. So it's like your body is studying for an exam. So the first dose allows your body to learn about it. The second dose, you learn, your body learns about it even more. So that's why you give it in two doses, to strengthen your, bo your body's response to it, because it dealt with it, it's like twice, as opposed to one time. All right, Doc, thanks a lot for coming to share with us. Um, highly appreciated. You preempted one of my questions, and that is the issue of well, how, how well does the AstraZeneca deal with uh, the variants? And so okay. you preempted that question. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to make some comments, not necessarily ask a question, and you can feel free to comment on it. Okay. But from extensive reading and um, and, and discussion among our own people, and particularly church people. Yeah. Our issue is not an issue of the science. Okay. Our issue is one, religious, mm -hmm. where we have interpretations of the vaccine and whatever is put in the vaccine relating to to abuse and Mac and that kind of thing. Okay. And, and so my own response to that is, why is it that we don't put it in all the blood pressure medication, which is much more prevalent than vaccines and all that, but, but that is part of the issue okay. among, among faith, people of faith. Yeah. Unfortunately, another issue which is prevalent the world over is a political issue. I agree. And, and so, and so these are very challenging because the, the medical aspects or the science, you can explain it away. The other issues are issues of the heart, mm -hmm. are issues of convincing people, issues of, of dealing with what really is substantial thoughtlessness. How the medical fraternity here is going to deal with it, I'm not quite sure. But by observation, I recognize that in Antigua, for example, yep. where they had all about the same number of vaccines as we received, their vaccines were finished in about two weeks, whereas ours dragged out for two months for the first 10,000. And I am minded to believe that because in Antigua people became gravely ill, there yep. were several deaths, the response to the vaccine was, was far more meaningful and I want to end what I'm saying by a, I don't want to call it a prediction, but in as much as the government and the people involved has done so well to keep um, the virus at bay here, it will not last forever. Yeah, it's a virus we're talking about and eventually people here are going to become infected. Yeah. As much as I would not want it to happen. My own advice and encouragement is for people to go and take the vaccine. 
it has economic implications. I'm surprised that there are several people who are not working who still ain't taking the vaccine. When the vaccine provides a vehicle towards ensuring that economic activity restarts and then some balance is restored. I'd like to thank you so much for being here and I hope that many, many people here would take you being here seriously and before they leave, they take the vaccine. All right, thank you. Right, she, has a, she has a question. Excuse me, right. what, what is inside the vaccine? Okay. All right, so that's a very good question. All right, so there, the vaccine, there's active ingredients, okay? And there's inactive ingredients in the vaccine. So the active in ingredients is the common cold virus, okay? That sends the information to produce the COVID-19 proteins. That's the active ingredient, okay? The inactive ingredients are just used to preserve the virus so it's um, alive so that um, our bodies can respond to it, okay? So the inactive ingredients include salt, water, essential amino acids like L-histidine, it includes magnesium, calcium, it includes something called polysorbate 80, which is used in a lot of things that keeps things together, like ice cream is used in cream, it's used in soap, it's used in so many things that we use regularly. Um, I believe that's all the ingredients there is. But that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. That was one of my questions. Okay. I, w I wanted to hear the ingredients in lemon term like it did for her, so thank you for that. The other question is, it's well and good to create a vaccine for well people, but the numbers of people who are dying is way out of control. How is it then that we have not created something to give to the people who are dying by the thousands daily to counteract that, to stop the death. Yes, you are zero in on those who are well, but what about those who are already sick? How is it you have, we have not created, and I said we, because I'm a member of the human race, human race yeah. right? So why is it we haven't um, created a vaccine and is pushing it for those who are sick? Okay. We're only pushing something for those who are well. I understand what you said all morning, but mm. my, my, my focus is on those Why? who are sick and How are dying How can we have largely daily, and that number is not decreasing either. Okay, so vaccines are used for prevention, um, not necessarily cure. Um, so regarding, so if you're talking, is there any specific illness you're speaking about that you can... Oh, so, okay, so vaccines, all vaccines do is stimulate your immune system to protect against an illness before you get it, so you don't get the complications of the illness. That's all vaccines have ever done. Um, they have been looking for ways to cure COVID-19, et cetera. They've been trying to find some medications. I'm sure you've heard it on the news that they've been using certain medications on different people saying, okay, this can work, that, that can work. But what they're finding out is these people are still getting complications from the COVID-19 afterwards. So even if you try to support them, use these medications to de decrease the severity of the sickness, you're still getting complications afterwards. And that's the problem. And the reason why we can't, let's say, invent uh, vaccines for certain illnesses, I know individuals would speak about HIV and those type of things because um, it's not that easy to um, invent a vaccine for certain viruses or bacteria. Um, the reason is because each virus and bacteria have certain mechanisms or different ways to avoid um, um, the immune system. For, for instance, HIV, for example, um, it mutates very quickly. Um, 
there, where there's a new HIV, type of HIV every day if you have HIV and you're not taking your medication. It also hides from the immune system in, it's in your DNA. So whenever you take your medication and you stop taking it, it can start again and reproduce new versions of itself. And it also attacks the very system that is there to defend you. So that's why we haven't invented a vaccine for um, illnesses such as that. But we have invented at least over 20 different vaccines um, in the world for over, since the invention of vaccines itself. Um, and without vaccines, it sa vaccines save at least 3 million lives a year. Um, since the beginning, since the beginning of the first vaccine, we've saved over a billion lives because of that, whether it was from polio, whether it was from um, um, measles, mumps, rubella, um, tetanus, um, even Ebola has a vaccine that has came out um, fairly recently. So vaccines are extremely important. It's not as easy to develop them. In this case, we were lucky that we had um, information on on the SARS virus. So COVID-19 is actually a relative or a spin-off to the SARS virus. So we had information prior to that. So developing a vaccine became a lot more simple because we already had information that we can just apply to this virus here. And since it was a global pandemic, getting money for research, well, that was no problem because everyone wanted to return back to normalcy. Everyone wanted to be able to, you know, um, stop social distancing and all these type of things. So getting that money there, that, that would be no issue. And research takes millions and millions of dollars, whether, because participants, there's at least, at least 25,000 participants in each study. Um, for each of these vaccines. So you have to be able to test all these individuals. You have to be able to follow them up. You have to have the resources, the machinery um, available. And trust me, one of these, one machine, um, for instance, the, the ultra cold storage fridge for these vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, each of them costs around 200,000 US just for one of them. And so just a simple machine just to hold the vaccines that you're testing these individuals on costs 200,000 US dollars. Um, that doesn't include the testing apparatus um, to test for the virus, et cetera. So it's millions and millions and millions of dollars for just, um, just for the research. And that money was already there and we used an emergency use authorization. So what that is, is they don't s skip any steps during the clinical trials or the studies, but emergency use authorization, all it does is say, while they're conducting the studies, they can make the vaccine at the same time. So they basically, instead of the regular way, they would conduct the studies, and once it's approved, then they would make the vaccines, but they would make the vaccines along with the, the, with the studies, and once the, vaccine, once the studies are proven that the vaccines are safe and effective, then they would approve it, and, but they would already have a stockpile of vaccines to distribute to the public right away, as opposed to having to wait for the time period for the vaccines to be reproduced. That's the only difference um, as to why the vaccines came out so quickly, is because they were already producing it while they were um, conducting the studies, and once the studies proved that they were safe, then it was distributed to the public. In three days, he mm -hmm. was recovered because they gave him some kind of a quote-unquote concussion. Well, if that concussion was so effective for him, how is it that that concussion is not made public to the other people who is sick? Okay. Um, I saw him three days after. He didn't look recovered to me. <laughs> he, he, he didn't look recovered to me. <laughs> but I guess he was, he looked, he... He was, he was able to, to at least leave the hospital. Um, so um, 
I forgot the actual name of the medicate, the combinations of medications they used for him specifically. Um, those medications are available to the public, um, but a lot of those medications come with severe side effects and complications, such as heart disease. Um, it comes with kidney failure and those type of things. So you, I, I guess since he was the US president, they were able to monitor all these things um, down to the, the T. Um, so he would have, he was put in a very special care facility where they can monitor every and anything, how much is going in his system, what's in his system, and those type of things. So that was, even though these medications are available, there's, there's a danger with using them, um, especially if you're not in a facility where they can monitor everything to the T. And what we're seeing around the world is, um, even in the USA, Hospitals are there to the brim with people in the ICU. It's full, it's filled. There's not enough staff there to monitor patients because he's the US president. He's going to have all these people and all these doctors and all, all the resources available to him as opposed to the regular person. So his would be the most ideal state, but it's not, um, I guess, plausible for the masses of individuals and even though he reco well, recovered, he didn't look his, his, his very best. I think, I think he decided to go up and you know, make a statement to show that he, he beat COVID, but he didn't look, it looked like COVID beat him. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, uh, persons who are suffering with um, high blood pressure and mm -hmm. diabetes or maybe have cancer, can they take the, vi um, the vaccine? Okay. so. Yes, they can. Um, I know of individuals who have all of those things and they've taken the vaccine and they're fine. The only thing that I would warn any individual who has any medical conditions is to make sure their medical condition is controlled before they take the vaccine. So for instance, if you're diabetic, I want to make sure that your blood sugar is controlled because uncontrolled blood sugar affects your immune system and how it responds. So if you don't have your immune system responding properly, it can't develop an immunity or defense against COVID-19. So I would make sure that all of these are under control. So if you do have high blood pressure, diabetes, or even cancer, make sure that it's at least controlled so that you can take the vaccine. So go to your private doctor, um, or you can ask advice um, from a doctor you may know or a nurse to see if you're fit enough to take the vaccine. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, hey, good afternoon. No problem. Um, the, co the coronavirus is technically a common cold virus. The, the, the vaccine doesn't cure, right? Vaccines are for prevention, yes. So are you saying that, let's suppose that I had the common cold for a while. I'm just say, I'm taking the normal cold medicines, right? Mm -hmm. And then after a while, a while, I mean, you realize that it's not, it's like, you realize it have to be something more than that. Are you saying that if I take the COVID, the vaccine then, when I realize what's going on, that it doesn't make, a, it, would it make a difference then because I already have the COVID in my system? Uh, would taking the vaccine at that time be a waste of time? Okay, um, so you asked a few questions there. Um, so regarding that one that you just asked, um, if you're currently sick, um, I wouldn't take the vaccine right away. I would wait till I recover um, to take the vaccine. And to differentiate between the common cold and if you have COVID-19, it can be very difficult. The only way you'd really know is unless you get actually tested to know because the symptoms are so similar. Sometimes you can have mild symptoms and you have COVID-19 and, or it could just be a common cold or it could just be a flu, you don't know. 
Um, so that's why it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what's the cause of these symptoms. So the only way to really know is to get tested. But for instance, if I'm in a, a area or a country where there's high COVID-19, I'm more likely to go and get tested as opposed to if I'm, let's say, St. Kitts, where we have very strict um, protocols and policies for individuals getting in, um, I'm less likely to go and get tested for COVID-19. So um, is there any other question there? Because I know you asked a, a few small ones. I, I don't know if I'm... Yeah. So no, you can still take... The, if, if it is COVID-19 you do have, right? You can still take it afterwards. Um, the, reason, the reason being is you, it's possible that you can get COVID-19 again, right? And the second time may not be as good as the first time, where you can get severely ill, hospitalized, or you can possibly die. And so that's why it's important to take the vaccine, because the vaccines, all of them, not just the AstraZeneca, prevent those three things, severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And it also prevents the long-term complications from occurring as well. So that's my advice. Oh. Sorry. I, uh. Yes, yes. So the flu shot only. So the flu shot only stops um, the flu virus. So uh, influenza virus. So it would be different. Okay, next question. Hi. For someone who has a history of anaphylactic reaction to being vaccinated, myself, okay. um, do the health centers here have like epinephrine or something on site or even downstairs? Yes, so they, they <laughs> to help um, should say some, me or someone like me have a reaction? Yes, so they should have all the necessary medication for any anaphylactic reaction or extreme allergic reaction to any um, contents there when you're taking the vaccine. That's why they, they monitor you at least for 15 minutes after to see if there's any reaction. So some, some signs of allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions can be shortness of breath, um, swelling in the lips, the tongue, rashes, itching, um, even dizziness can be a sign, because that could be a sign your blood pressure is getting low. So these are the signs that you would um, look for, um, not even just for the 15 minutes, but even afterwards. Usually after the 15 minutes, it's usually not going to be as severe as when you first get into contact with um, this, whatever ingredients you may be allergic to. So that's why it's important to be mindful. Um, and just look at yourself for the first 24 hours, even after the first 15 minutes. And if you do see any of these signs or feel any of these things, then I would advise you call either 911 or you go straight to the hospital so you can get treated um, to prevent this reaction from going any further than it has to. Me again. So if... Mm -hmm. if, if if you have heart problem, mm -hmm. or if you take chemo radiation, or even kidney um, problem, can such people um, take the vaccine, or would they have complications? So they are okay. advised not to. Okay, so that's a very interesting question, and it's important because. Um, people who are having certain issues, let's say they are taking chemotherapy and doing radiation, um, that's, that would be specific to the person, okay? So individuals who take chemotherapy or radiation, sometimes that can actually affect how your immune system functions as well, because chemotherapy and radiation um, doesn't discriminate against good cells versus bad cells. So it can damage some of your good cells, um, mainly the cell and your cells in your immune system, so your immune system may not respond properly and your body may be too weak, especially after chemotherapy and radiation, because that actually affects your body. So um, I would actually seek advice of the doctor who is administering 
the chemo and the radiation um, to see if you are actually fit to take it. Um, usually individuals who are going through chemotherapy and radiation, I don't think they would be fit to take it at that time um, because their body is going through a, a whole lot with the chemotherapy and the radiation because it, will, it can destroy some of the good cells in your body and you'll be in a weakened state and your immune system would be um, a bit compromised because of that. With the AstraZeneca viral, uh, vaccine, you mm -hmm. take two shots. Yes. With the Johnson, you only take one. What is the difference? What is the difference? Well, it's... Um, so, the AstraZeneca, when you take two shots, okay, the effectiveness is a little higher than the Johnson & Johnson. Um, the Johnson & Johnson is made up of... It's practically made in the same way that AstraZeneca is. It's one shot, but it's not as effective as the AstraZeneca, according to the studies that we've read. Um, even though the Johnson & Johnson's one shot meets the requirements of the World Health Organization, where the efficacy is above 50%. So there is technically not too much of a difference regarding in terms of you being protected between the severe illness, the hospital hospitalization and death. But there is a slight advantage with the AstraZeneca, the fact that it's a little bit more effective as it goes up to 90%, as opposed to the Johnson & Johnson, which only goes up to about 80 plus percent. And she's asking another question. Um, I think she had another question. Um, the nurses are here. So if anyone feels inspired to take the vaccine, they're there, and I believe they're downstairs. My question is, yeah. if you're born with an illness, if you have to consult a doctor first before you can take the vaccine. Well, it depends what type of illness. And if leukemia. you're- Leukemia. Leukemia? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would definitely con consult my doctor with leukemia because leukemia is uh, a cancer of your immune system, your white blood cells, okay? I would definitely consult with my doctor regarding that because it can definitely affect how my immune system responds to the vaccine. I would definitely, for sure. But if it's, if it's, if your doctor finds it safe, then you can, okay? Once the leukemia is okay. Dr. Sebastian, um, thanks for coming. Um, no problem. I did have an opportunity to listen to you on the radio. Okay. Um, quite instructive, quite informative. Um, I did my personal research, mm -hmm. a lot of studies, um, YouTube, the internet, and I came to the conclusion that the vaccine was, was very safe, and so I went and got my first shot. Okay, that's great. Um, having said that, um, and a follow-up to Brother Cook's observation. It appears to me that our good figures, the statistics in St. Kitts, perhaps is what is keeping back people from um, going to take the vaccine. I'm looking at Jamaica's figures, Jamaica. It says in Jamaica, 41,843 confirmed cases. Yeah. Recovered, 18,690. Dead, 661. Yeah. I heard a case where the pilots, that the guys who bring the ships to the docks, the one strike last week, demanding to take a, to take a virus, to take um, the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, there was a Brits campaign to take virus shots yesterday, and it was overwhelming. I had, a, I had the opportunity to drive um, Easter Monday or, frigate, or to Frigate Bay, talking about our statistics. I look on the Frigate Bay lawn, and there's uh, thousands of people massing, thousands. I went after six. Endless cars, people. One person was wearing a mask, my observation. I go to the peninsula, Kakashel Bay, that was even more people, the young people. 
above 18, thousands of them. I'm of the view that our good figures, as Burkut was suggested, is perhaps holding back people from taking the vaccine. You know, people are saying, look, we are safe. You know, we don't have any deaths. You know, we don't have any, somebody confirmed, 41. It, it, it isn't much, all right? So perhaps maybe something has to happen before people take it serious. And, and that is scary to me. What, yeah. what was really scary to me is Monday. And I understand there was action in Nevis, there was action in Sandy Point, there was action in the flower rounds yesterday, and it's over and over. So my question to you, do you think that our good figures uh, preventing people from getting going forward and, and being vaccinated. Yes, yeah, so I still, I, I do think there's a false sense of security um, because of our figures. So we have 44, we had 44 confirmed cases and 44 have recovered. So because we've had such a small amount of cases and they've all recovered, that's why we're feeling like, okay, we're safe, we have the quarantine, we have the strict protocols. But you also have to remember that those 44 cases that came in, there were tons of cases that got denied to come onto the flight to come in because they tested positive. So we, we could have had a larger influx of individuals if we never had these protocols in place. And if we never had the two week quarantine where these individuals are tested several times during the quarantine, and during the quarantine, then we could have had community spread. Um, and we can see it with our neighboring islands like Antigua, um, who's, who've had individuals who have si who've been sick, individuals who have died. Um, there's islands like St. Lucia, where, who, um, where COVID-19 has taken a hold on the population for some time now. And individuals have died as well, Jamaica, where I've, I've studied and I've worked for at least two years. Um, my colleagues tell me that the horror stories in the hospitals where individuals are really sick, they don't have enough protective equipment um, to deal with these individuals. 30% of the staff get si got sick at one point, um, the nursing staff and doctors are out. So we are protected in this bubble almost, and we haven't really experienced the traumas where we know of individuals right here in front of our eyes who are getting sick. Um, and I think we've sort of taken it for granted because it's like the old saying, out of sight, out of mind, and that's what's going on. So we have to be mindful and we, we just need to look to our neighbors right here in the Caribbean and pe individuals who are actually going through this you know, they're not making it up. People are really getting sick. People are really dying from COVID-19. So we have to take that into mind. We've just been so well protected that we're not actually seeing or experiencing it up close and personal. Because everyone knows, for example, there are wars happening around the world every day, but that's not in the forefront of our mind. Because it's not happening right here at home, right in front of us. Okay, so... We have to try to, I guess, you know, detach ourselves from just here and then just look to our brothers and sisters just right next door to us. Because on a clear day, I can see Antigua, you know? And that's just right over the water. Um, nurses are downstairs and uh, they need at least 10 persons to start the process. So, so would, if you are, uh, a candidate for this. Would you go downstairs, please? So, if anyone's interested, you know, I hope I answered your fears, your concerns. If you have any more questions, please. Cuba? Yes. Okay, so it's very hard to get information out of Cuba. Um, so I've been actually trying to, res to, to do research on the Cuban vaccine. I've talked to my Cuban colleagues. Um, they, were un they were unable to give me information themselves 
So they've been trying to get in touch with their professors, their researchers and stuff. So it's very hard to get a lot of information about the data and how the, the vaccines are actually doing. Um, but from what I know so far, there are two vaccines that are ready to be released. One is very promising. Um, they're in stage three um, clinical trials, um, meaning they're, t they're testing its safety and effectiveness um, in the population. Uh, so what I know is they're trying to distribute it among their population first. Um, and then afterwards, they would probably try to distribute it around the world. So they're going to make sure their Cuba is safe, and then they're going to distribute it around the world. That's the, that's the only information I have. But so far, since it's gone to stage three, you know that the vaccine is working because it, it at least does that. But it's not just now to test it in a large population first to see how safe it is for distribution around the world. All right. You don't have, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a prevention. Ex yeah. A measure. Yeah. Ounce of prevention is much better than a pound of cure. We don't have the facility. Uh, I, I've been to the ICU visiting, and <laughs> we really don't have we, the we resources to take care of people Yeah, serious if we case. have an increase in, in, in so, an ounce of prevention, better than a pound of cure. I agree. Word to the wise. Prevention is better than cure. Um, it, in every way, financially, <laughs> Um, Health-wise, it's better than cure. Any other questions? Any other concerns? Hi. You see how America have the vaccine for the teenagers? Mm -hmm. Would they bring it to sink it eventually? Okay, so, the, so what's happening now is all the vaccines are starting to, to test out um, their vaccine on in the younger individuals, okay? So that's what's happening now. So the Pfizer, I think that's what you're speaking about, um, it's asking for approval to do it in people 12 to 15, okay? Because they can do it from 16 to, to up in it, to whatever age. Um, so that's all they're doing. And the only reason that it wasn't offered to teenagers or younger children is because when they did the initial research, it was only done in adults. So they usually test everything in adults first, and then they test it in children after. And the reason they do that is because children are still growing and developing, so that's why. So they've done their research, they finished their research in children, and now they're asking for approval to distribute it to children now. So all the other vaccines, are, companies are trying to get that done. So it's only a matter of time before every vaccine would be able to um, be given to children. Okay. Eventually, we're gonna have to pay for the vaccine. So. This is what's happening in the world. So St. Kitts, we're really lucky because we actually want, we're actually one of the few countries that have access to um, nearly enough vaccines to, 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 to get herd immunity because we have about, we have, a, when we have about at least 40 plus thousand um, doses of the vaccine in St. Kitts and Nevis, right? Um, those including the ones that were given and we are going to get uh, at least 10 more thousand, uh, 10 more thousand doses so we can complete um, the herd immunity. And we're one of the lucky few because we have a small population. The COVAX facility don donated 21,600 doses and we had a previous 21,000 doses there 
and we just need around 10 more thousand doses so we can get to that mark of herd immunity. So unlike, um, for instance, I believe it is Jamaica. I think they only had around 14,000 or so doses. Jamaica has 2.9 million people. That's not going to make a dent in Jamaica, but think is we're lucky enough to have this opportunity. But at the same time, the, the vaccines do have an expiration date, just like anything. Um, anything has, everything has an expiration date and it only lasts six months. So it's a possibility that some of these vaccines may, may go to waste if we don't um, go and actually take the shot. Um, there's a, a limit on how, how many we can actually attain because right now, um, some of the larger countries are hoarding the vaccines for their own people, just in case of an outbreak or anything like that. Um, so to, to actually have access to these vaccines is very difficult. So it's not even, even if we had the money to purchase all the vaccines in the world, um, the access and the creation of these vaccines are also a factor that we have to consider because there's not enough vaccines being created at this pace to supply the entire world yet. But St. Kitts is in the position to actually get to our goal um, by this year if everyone decides to go out and take the vaccine um, for that reason. So I hope that answers your question. So it's a possibility that we, we may need to spend money on it if we don't take this opportunity that we have because we, we don't know what the future holds based on different countries hoarding the vaccines and the amount of vaccines being produced. But the AstraZeneca um, vaccine is a nonprofit organization, so they plan not to make a profit off of creating the vaccines as compared to the Pfizer and Moderna. And it's actually on their website, they don't plan to make any money um, from creating this vaccine until this pandemic is over. Um, she asks how, no, she asks, when the babies get the coronavirus, how do they clear it? So when babies get the coronavirus, how do, how do they clear it? So they clear it like um, any one of us. Um, so our immune system basically keeps the virus from getting, from getting us severely ill and they clear it naturally. So, but the good part is, um, what studies have shown is that babies and very, very, very young children, they don't seem to get severely ill often. It's very rare. There have been a few cases where babies and very young children have gotten very sick and they have passed from the coronavirus. But luckily, it's, actually, it's only the really young adults and the elderly people that get severely ill um, from the infection but they tend to just clear the virus. Any other questions? So has anyone changed their mind on getting the vaccine? Or you're still debating, or you need to do a little bit more research, you need to clear your minds a little more, that's fine. You know, I've been studying about this vaccine since last year, since the pandemic has started, so I've had a head start on everyone else. I've read about the clinical trials and those type of things. So I've been looking at the data and I've seen how it correlates and all those things. And you yourselves haven't gotten that length of time or the access to all this information. So I understand why you would be skeptical and then the news, the media and stuff, it's a new headline every day. It's bam, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And honestly, we've never really had to deal with this problem before because how many of you guys have ever asked how quick paracetamol was invented? That, that's never been a question, <laughs> you know? But the headline said, whoa, the vaccine came out this quick, bam. So then that puts a little seed of doubt and fear in your mind. And scientists and researchers, usually we know about all these things um, months or even years before this happens. So we usually have all the information right there and ready, but now we have news outlets just shooting this information out every day, every day, every day. So there's some new fear, a new concern coming from every individual. Oh, somebody got an allergic reaction to this vaccine, blah, 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 etc. cetera. But um, allergic reactions have, can, can happen to, to anyone um, from any medication, from food, from something they touch. 
So it's not something necessarily new that happens. It's just more pronounced now that a microscope is on this vaccine or that vaccine or anything that has to do with coronavirus because it's a big headline right now. So I hope I changed some minds today to go and get the vaccine. Um, thank you very much for having me. Afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Sebastian for not only coming but doing the research so that when he came, he was able to answer our questions and not leave any doubts in our minds. Okay, so we want to thank you and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Um, Sister Jeffers, could you find out for me uh, if the, the folks are down there? Um, I, know, I know a few of them, but I came back up and we don't want to. I see one, Mr. Mr. Rita. Okay, let's see what three what what 